Hello everybody, welcome to another Flaming Dice Reviews video. Uh, my name is Matt, and today we're going to be looking at a game that I have been highly anticipating for quite some time now, and that is Star Wars Armada, the large-scale battle answer to Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures game. Uh, I really thought, or really had a lot of uh, preconceived notions about this game, and the game proved me wrong on a lot of points. Uh, we're going to take a look at what comes in the box, a little bit about how the game plays, a little of the differences between uh, Armada and X-Wing, because I think a lot of people think that it is going to be very similar. Uh, and then we'll come back here and we'll talk about my final thoughts and give it a Flaming Dice Review score. I'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Now, of course, what everybody wants to see is the minis and my gosh, they are absolutely beautiful. Uh, starting on the far left, we have the Victory Class Star Destroyer. Uh, that is the one ship, because the game does differentiate between squadrons of fighters and ships. Uh, that is the one ship for the Imperial side in the core set. Uh, and it is, oddly enough, only a medium ship because the game has yet to have any large ships even once the rest of wave one gets here it's all going to be mediums and smalls and these two on the right are examples of small ships in the middle you have the CR-90 uh, Corvette uh, on the rebel side and then the Nebulon on the far right which has always been one of my very favorite ships in the Star Wars universe it has such a distinctive shape and then the game also comes with four squadrons of X-Wing and six squadrons of TIE Fighters. So let's take a look a little bit closer look at the ships and how they operate. Here we're going to take a look at the ship bases and some of the symbols on there and what they mean. Uh, this is the CR-90 Corvette. And if we look at the red lines that are on the ship base, that actually divides the ship into four different hull zones. And each hull zone has its own attack stats, its own shield values. So if you look down at the bottom of the shield bases, there's actually these spinning dials. And that's how much, or how many shields, the ship has on each hull zone. For example, the CR-90 has two shields on the front, two shields on the right and left hull zone, and only one shield on the back. And then each of these hull zones also have different attack dice that they can use. And some of them are a little bit more deadly than others. The Star Destroyer, for example, whenever it gets really close, has a high chance of doing critical damage to other ships. So let's take a look at some of the other aspects, uh, including movement. Let's take a look at one of my favorite aspects of this game, and that is movement of the ships. Uh, ships have a movement dial, much like in Star Wars, but instead of it holding secret maneuvers and trying to outmaneuver your opponents, it holds a speed. And that speed can be anywhere from zero, one, two, three, or four. And the ship cards in this game have an entire section dedicated to speed. For example, the Nebulon has a top speed of three. The four column is blank. And these hashtags denote how maneuverable the Nebulon is at these different speeds. So at speed one, the articulating maneuver tool can be clicked one time at the first joint if it's going at speed one. At speed two, the first and second joint can be clicked once. At speed three, the first joint cannot be clicked at all, denoted by the little hyphen. The second can be clicked once and the third twice. Now I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So none for the first joint, once for the second joint, and twice for the third joint. So we're going to put the movement dial down and then move the ship one, two, three. So you can see it actually went from pretty straightforward to starting to turn a little bit. 
And depending on which way you turn, the first joint determines how drastic the turn is. Now let's talk about things that are off of the playing area. And again, anyone who's familiar with X-Wing will know that there's a lot of stats left on cards that are off of the battlefield. Well, actually, pretty much any miniatures game. And Star Wars Armada is no different. Now one thing you'll notice on this side are these large tarot sized uh, cards for the ships. And this is the Rebel side, the CR-90 uh, Corvette and the Nebulon B frigate. Now ships have these symbols on their cards which are defensive symbols and this ship also has corresponding tokens. So during a turn a player can use these tokens to give different uh, different abilities to their ship while they're defending from attacks. And once an ability is used it's flipped over. Now that ability cannot be used again that turn unless you're willing to lose it for the game. So once an ability has been flipped over, if you use it again on the same turn, it's gone for good. Uh, another part of these cards, the ship cards, are the this diagram down at the bottom which shows the four different hull zones, their shield values, and their attack dice that they have uh, out of those hull zones. Another thing on the card are these stats, meaning, or I'll show you an example of a couple of these. The engineering values, the two on the Corvette A and the three on the Nebulon, are its engineering, which lends itself to repairing the ships during combat. Another really cool aspect of Star Wars Armada. Uh, the squadron value, which allows it to manipulate squadrons. Uh, during certain times uh, if certain abilities are used and then it's command value and the CR-90 is a command value of 1, the Nebulon is a command value of 3, the Star Destroyer is a command value of uh, excuse me, the Nebulon is a command value of 2, the Star Destroyer is a command value of 3. Now what that does is it lets you use these command dials. So the CR-90 every turn you get to choose one of these abilities and these abilities let you either change speed manipulate the squadrons or let them attack early uh, repair or do a special attack or a more powerful attack out of one of your whole zones so every turn we, the player chooses one of these commands and places it face down and he only gets one of these for the CR 90 because the command value is one the Nebulon however has a command value of two the ship is a little bit more powerful, but it takes more planning. So every turn, whenever you do, whenever you choose one of these commands, you have to place it on the bottom of the stack. So you have to make your moves one turn ahead of time. Uh, and on the Star Destroyer, you have to make your, your decisions three turns ahead of time. Another thing is anyone that's familiar with X-Wing will recognize these upgrade cards. For example, you have assault missiles, turbo lasers, and abilities that benefit you during battle. You also have uh, players, or excuse me, characters like Leia, Nav Team, or Grand Moff Tarkin. And the ships are very highly um, customizable, just like in X-Wing, and they all have their command, or excuse me, their cost values down at the bottom. So Grand Moff Tarkin, for example, is very expensive, but he gives a very big bonus whenever you're building your fleet. Let's talk briefly about attacking uh, the ship's stats during attacking and the role that range plays in this game. Now, anybody who's played X-Wing is familiar with this range ruler or wand or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's one of the biggest differences in combat, uh, even though it looks fairly similar. So if you can see this, uh, the Star Destroyer has its, attack, whoa, has its attack dice printed on the front, uh, in its front hull zone. I'm not sure if you can see that, but you might be able to see it printed here. It's three red and three black dice. Now, with the range finder, we see that when you attack a ship at range one, meaning this area here, you can use your black, red, and blue dice. Any black, red, or blue dice printed in that hole zone that you're attacking from. 
At range 2, you can use red and blue. And at range 3, you can only use red. So at range 1, the Star Destroyer would be able to use its black and red dice as denoted by the range ruler. So at this, this distance, the Star Destroyer, two hits, three, four hits, and a crit could do a lot of damage. If, however, the range was just a little bit further at range two, you'll notice that at range two, only red and blue dice can be used. So in this example, at range two, the Star Destroyer is way less effective. Let's take a little look at combat in Star Wars Armada. We're going to focus on the ships. Now ships can fire twice each turn, but only once out of each of its four hull zones. In this scenario, we're going to pretend that the squadrons aren't there, they're just there for a little visual flare. The Star Destroyer can only get a shot on the Nebulon out of its left hull zone. However, the Nebulon can get a shot on the Star Destroyer out of both its front hull zone and its right hull zone. So it's going to get to shoot the Star Destroyer twice. Now the Star Destroyer, we're going to let him shoot first. He's going to take a shot at the Nebulon and he got one hit. So the Nebulon would drop from three shields in the front hull zone to one, or excuse me, from three to two because he got one hit. The Nebulon is going to shoot back and out of its front hull zone he can use three red whenever he attacks. He got a hit and a crit, so we're going to take the shields from three down to one on the Star Destroyer. Now we're going to shoot out of the right hull zone. And because we're still at range two, we're going to use his red and blue dice and fire again at the left hull zone of the Star Destroyer. And we got three hits, so the assuming that we had no tokens to use we would take the shields down to zero with one of those hits the remaining two hits would be assigned as damage cards just like you've probably seen in X-Wing miniatures game if you've played that crits whenever they're assigned are assigned face up and they negatively affect the ship that it has happened to welcome back everybody now that we've seen what comes inside of the box and seen a little bit about how the game plays, uh, let's talk about my final thoughts on Star Wars Armada. Uh, first of all, I really, really enjoyed this game. I just, I have been looking forward to it for so long, and one of the first things that jumps out at me is the just wonderful quality of the minis. If I was to score this game, based solely on the minis, it would be out of this world. Um, but I tried to be objective despite how much I've been looking forward to this game. Um, one, of the, one of the pros of this game, a big pro to this game, is the scale. The scale really feels right. I was worried about it uh, because it is that relative scale that we kept hearing about, where this isn't really the size of a TIE fighter next to a Star Destroyer. But when everything is said and done and the battlefield is set, it really feels right. It really does. It captures that huge uh, space opera battlefield feel really well. Uh, another thing I really liked is the movement in this game for the ships. But I have a caveat. The movement is both a pro and a con. The pro to it is that when you have this articulating uh, wand, movement, uh, stick, whatever you want to call it. It really captures uh, the movement, the inertia, the mass of these ships as they move through space. I'll get to the, the con in just a moment. Uh, the other, or another thing about it is Wave 1. When Wave 1 hits, or at least the rest of it, other than the core ship, or core set, I think it's really going to fill it out very nicely uh, get a small ship uh, to, for the Imperials and a medium ship for the Rebels. I think that will really, really fill it out. Also, we'll be getting the TIE Interceptors, TIE Bombers, the uh, A-Wings, B-Wings, Y-Wings, and one more for the Imperials 
tie advanced. Uh, and again, the other really big pro is the miniatures themselves. They just look phenomenal. I mean, just out of this world. Uh, on to things that I didn't care for. Uh, the con that I mentioned with movement. Movement can be a pain uh, in the butt. If you have all of these ships laid out like this, and this ship goes to move, that wand will make you have to reposition everything just to move this ship. Or you can risk breaking it apart to make it shorter. I didn't want to do that because it didn't seem like the, the joints in that articulating movement piece would hold up to too many times of doing that. So movement can be, just despite all of its wonderfulness, it can be a pain. Uh, another con is though I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of Wave 1. I wish it had come. I wish we'd had you know, more Nebulon Bs to, to field without having to buy another core set. Uh, but again, I know it's coming. Uh, hopefully it'll be here very soon. Uh, another con, which I'm not holding against the game, is uh, storage and cost. Of course, it's Fantasy Flight game. They produce wonderful models, but they aren't cheap. Uh, another thing is storing these. Uh, just like anybody who's addicted to X-Wing, like I am, uh, knows, you have to have a pretty good storage system going on. Again, you know that getting into the game, so you can't hold it against the game, but there is that. Uh, the last little quibble that I have is the rulebook that comes inside of the game. Uh, or inside of the core set, it was a little bit vague on several points and just with all the detail that's in the game I really would have expected the rule book to be near flawless but again that's very minor but the uh, the rule book was especially on, on squadrons it was a little bit a little bit vague uh, I have I've had to consult the internet for several rules clarifications because the rule book just wasn't wasn't up to snuff in some areas. With all that being said, uh, I really, really highly recommend Star Wars Armada. Uh, if you have $100 to go and drop on a core set right now, uh, I would recommend doing it, especially if you want to capture that large battlefield scale that X-Wing just doesn't do, even with the, um, the huge ships. It just doesn't capture the feeling of Star Destroyers bearing down on CR-90 Corvettes like Armada does, uh, as much as I like X-Wing. Uh, we ran, or I ran, uh, Star Wars Armada through the Flaming Dice Review scoring system. It got an absolutely uh, great score, especially for a collectible game like this that cost so much and is really kind of hard to get into. The game scored an 89 uh, please remember to subscribe uh, and like this video as well. And if you'd like to read more articles and see more videos, uh, please visit the website. It's www.flamingdicereviews.com. And again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.